So. It's a way to fix this, like I, I TA. So sometimes I see my students a lack of, there's a lot of critical thinking. Like when you teach a language, it's almost like, it's like a mathematical problem and a logic association with conjugation of verbs. And I feel sometimes they're lacking in this, this basic knowledge of how to put two and two together. You know, two and two is four. The best way, the best way to teach people critical thinking is to teach them to write. And I, I made this little thing that I put online, it's, I don't know if, maybe, it, is it in the Psych 434 website? Do, did I post that rubric for essay writing? But I don't think it actually went through, I think it, but it's, it is still on 430, that's how I got Is it not on 434? Is that not you working? It almost not have gone through when you were doing it. Oh! Yeah, but, but I still found it. It's still in 430. Oh, okay. Well, there's an essay, oh, that's too bad. It, it's not on the Psych 434 website even? I, I didn't check. Because I updated it. Anyways, I have this guide to writing that's, that if it isn't on the 434 website, it is definitely on the 430 website. And uh, it steps people through the process of writing. Because what's happened now, it's very hard to teach people to write because it's unbelievably time intensive. And like writing, marking a good essay, that's really easy. Check A. You did everything right. right? Marking a bad essay? Oh my god. The words are wrong, the phrases are wrong, the sentences are wrong, they're not ordered right in the paragraphs, the paragraphs aren't coherent, and the whole thing makes no sense. So, trying to tell the person what they did wrong, it's like, well, you did everything wrong. Everything about this essay is wrong. Well, that's not helpful either. You have to find the few little things they did half right, and you have to teach them what they did wrong. It's really expensive. And so what I did with this rubric was try to address that from the production side instead of the grading side. But the best thing you can do is teach people to write. Because there's no difference between that and thinking. And one of the things that just blows me away about universities is that no one ever tells students why they should write something. It's like, well, you have to do this assignment. Well, why are you writing? Well, you need the grade. It's like, no. You need to learn to think. Because thinking makes you act effectively in the world. Thinking makes you win the battles you undertake. And those could be battles for good things. If you can think and speak and write, you are absolutely deadly. Nothing can get in your way. So that's why you learn to write. It's like, and I can't believe that people aren't just told that. It's, it's, it's like, it's the most powerful weapon you can possibly provide someone with. And I, I mean, I know lots of people who've been staggeringly successful and watched them throughout my life. I mean, those people, you don't want to have an argument with them. They'll just slash you into pieces. And not in a malevolent way. It's like, if you're going to make your point and they're going to make their point, you better have your points organized. Because otherwise, you're going to look like and be an absolute idiot. You are not going to get anywhere. And if you can formulate your arguments coherently, and make a presentation, if you can speak to people, if you can lay out a proposal, God, people give you money, they give you opportunities, you have influence, that's what you're at university for. And so that's what you do, is you, that's, you're, in, you're in English, right? You're, and yeah, in languages, anyways, it's like, yeah, te teach people to be articulate, because that's the most dangerous thing you can possibly be. So, and that's motivating, if people know that, it's like, well, why are you learning to write, because you're, here's your sword, here's your M16, right, here's your bulletproof vest. Like, you learn how to use them. But, ah, uh, it's just, it's an endless mystery to me why that isn't made self-evident. So, that's the sort of thing that can drive you mad trying to sort out. It's like people are, there's a, there's a conspiracy to bring people into the education system to make them weaker. So, I guess that keeps the competition down. Maybe that's one way of thinking about it. If your students are stupid, they're not going to challenge you. So, other questions? Disagreements? I mean, it's a pretty harsh indictment of the university system. When you were talking about marriage, um, you kind of made a point that if you stay, uh, which is, of course, a really good point, you you have more probabilities to get to a uh, solution, right? Yeah. But that is also, like, if, it's also assumed that you will always get to a solution.
Yes, true. Yes, and some, and yes, yes. No, no, but a solution that will keep the marriage. True. Well, you know, there used to be, before the divorce laws were really liberalized, there were, there, you could sue for irreconcilable differences. And, and sometimes people do find themselves in that situation. It's like one person wants children and the other person doesn't. It's like, that's a tough one. It's a tough one to negotiate. So, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that just because you lock yourself into a, like two cats in a barrel, that that will make you solve your problems. Because problems are hard to solve and sometimes you can't solve them. I was just pointing out what the cost of, of leaving the back door, what the cost of leaving the back door open is. And it's a big cost. And you know, one of the things I see too is that people's identities fragment increasingly across time. You know, one of the things that you have as you age is something like the continuity of your life. You know, you, you, you have someone that you're with, you've tied your story together with theirs, you have children, maybe they have children, it's like there's this continual payoff, so to speak, in quality that you obtain from staying within that frame. And you, you can jump out of that, and I suppose to some degree that that provides freedom, but it isn't obvious to me that it does that for people. But you're assuming that one specific relationship is uh, high quality. It may not be. No, but, but, but it's also the case that sequential relationships are unlikely to be that. So, look, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not make, I'm definitely not making a utopian case for marriage. So, I'm just, I would like to hear the case for divorce from you because it'd be really interesting, right? It's a strong point, but at the same time, I think there are some relationships that are really low quality. Yeah. And if we, if that's the case, then insisting in on them uh, cannot be good. Yeah, well, that's, that's definitely the alternative argument. And, and of course, there are strong things to be said on both sides. But See, there's some, there's some additional problems with divorce that people don't really grasp when they're young. Like, the idea that you can be divorced once you have children, that's kind of a stupid idea. Because you can't. You can, you, can, you can find a limited substitute for your initial freedom. But if you, if you have kids and you try to get divorced, the probability that that's going to demolish your life is very, very high. First of all, it's incredibly expensive. So one or both of you is going to come out of that poor. And your market value has declined. Let's say you're the woman who takes the kids. Your market value has declined radically. You're going to be poorer. The man, he's just as screwed. Because he is now an indentured servant. And there's no escape from it. So it's, and it's not so bad if you can negotiate a peaceful separation. And some people can. but. Lots of times, if you have a terrible relationship, it's not like negotiating a peaceful separation is all that easy. But if you're at each other's throats, good luck to you. I think it's roughly equivalent to having non-fatal cancer. It is not pleasant. It's a 10-year process, 15-year process. It'll cost you $250,000, and it'll tear a big chunk out of your life. And also, it will really disrupt your relationship with your kids. And, you know, you, you bring kids into a step-parent family, they do not do as well. Step-parents are not as good parents as biological parents, and the data on that is clear. Now, obviously, there are exceptions, because there are terrible biological parents, and there are wonderful step-parents. But if you look in aggregate, it's not that easy to care for children. You need everything you can binding you to them. And if they're someone else's children, Mostly they get in the way of the person that you love, right? Well, if I'm, let's say you have a child, I'll be right out. Let's say you have a child and I want to go out with you. Every second you spend with that child is the second you don't spend with me. And, and there's going to be a price for that. I'm not going to be happy about that. And, and if I have a child, you're going to feel exactly the same way. You might say, well, no, I love children. It's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure you do. I doubt it. You might love your child. And, and you know, it's pretty specific the way that people love children. So, 
And the rate of abuse for kids in step-parent families is way higher than it is in biological families. There's not even any comparison. So, anyways.